Why do groceries cost so much today? And who should I be mad at? I've got a first time guest and we're going to discuss it starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Welcome to Debt Free in 30. Who are you and what do you do? Well, I'm Sylvain Chalabois, uh, known uh, as the food professor for people who can't pronounce my name or spell my name. So the food professor is really the, the nickname I go with. Uh, I'm director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University. And uh, what we do is research in the food space from, from farm gate to plate. We're, we look at several issues, labeling, uh, international trades, processing, local foods, uh, and of course, food inflation, food prices. Uh, we actually spearhead the uh, Canada's Food Price Report Project along with the University of Guelph, the University of Saskatchewan, and UBC every single year for the last 15 years or so. So we forecast uh, what will likely happen at the grocery store over 12 months. Uh, and that report is released every December. Fantastic. And so the food professor, I will put links in the show notes. You have a, f- a podcast called the food professor. Your Twitter handle is food professor. So easy to, uh, easy to track you down. Now, I've got about eight hours worth of questions here, but you're limited on time. So we're going to, I got two main questions. My first one is how exactly does the system work? And I know it would take you a few university courses to explain that to me, but you know, how does it work? Who are the main players? How do prices get set? I mean, everybody's mad at that guy who I won't name, who owns that big grocery store chain, who just got a big raise this week. And, you know, we're all mad at him. So is he the guy I should be blaming? Is there somebody else? Can you kind of paint the picture of of how the the whole system works? Yeah. So so it's not that simple. Uh, I don't think that Galen Wesson is responsible for uh, Germany's 20% food inflation rate. Okay. It's a global phenomena. Let's face it. Canada actually has the third lowest food inflation rate within the G7 right now. So we're not doing too badly, but I don't think a few people, I think that few people actually care what actually is happening in Europe and elsewhere around the world. So we have a really robust food system in Canada, and it's basically uh, about production, farmers, uh, it's about processing, uh, it's about distribution and retail. Uh, And of course, we can't forget about service. Service restaurants are about, 30% 30% of the uh, agri-food pie in Canada. The entire market is worth about $240 billion in Canada. So about 70% of it is is retail. Uh, and that's dominated by a few players. I think everyone knows that by now. Uh, Loblaws, Sobeys, Metro, Costco, and Walmart. Uh, those are the fives. Uh, so we have a much more con- consolidated market than in the U.S., for example. In processing, it's all over the place. It's uh, it's global, it's local. There's all sorts of stuff going on. We don't process a whole lot in Canada specifically. Uh, most of the processing actually occurs in Ontario. Ontario actually has um, uh, the largest food manufacturing sector in the country. And actually, it rivals with cars in Ontario. So it's a pretty big sector. Nobody really talks about it, but it's a big sector. Quebec actually processes a lot of its commodities too. But elsewhere, it's not. It's processing is not really key. So we do import a lot from, from elsewhere, mainly from the United States. Now, as far as production goes, there's lots of trading. I mean, lots of our farmers actually do produce for the world, not just for Canadians. That's why often people say, how come my bread is more expensive? Don't we produce wheat in Canada? We do produce wheat in Canada for the world. And so that's why when uh, some tyrant decides to invade Ukraine uh, and uh, wheat futures go up, it impacts our own farmers as well. So everything is interconnected, which is why I think over the last 12 months, people are starting to realize that we're just not immune to what's going on uh, in the rest of the world. So it's a very complicated thing. It is not one guy who is jacking up the prices. It is literally a worldwide uh, phenomena. Now, you said that Canada has the third lowest inflation, food inflation rate. Yeah. 
out of the G7, so out of the... the including the, the EU. Including Correct. the EU, okay. Yeah. And now, when I look at the numbers, and we're recording this in April of 2023, if I've got my years right, um, the inflation rate overall has come down a little bit. I think the last print I saw was somewhere in the five-something percent range. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. The food inflation rate, though, is higher than that. We were bumping up in the 10% range, I believe, last numbers I saw. Is, yep. is there a reason that the food inflation rate is higher than the overall inflation rate? Or is it really what you just said? There's a whole bunch of different factors that, that flow into it. Uh, well, so right now we're really watching the gap between the inflation rate and the food inflation rate. And a lot of people are wondering why uh, are food prices still uh, skyrocketing at a grocery store while uh, the inflation rate is dropping. Well, essentially, there is a mechanism in place uh, around the world to reduce the inflation rate, and that's called the uh, uh, the bank central rate. Uh, central banks uh, do have uh, some power and ability to influence inflation. The problem with food is that it's, it's highly volatile. It's like energy. You know, you have OPEC deciding something, and all of a sudden, oil actually goes up or down. It's the same for food. Food is it is uh, is not necessarily impacted by interest rates. It, it I mean, rates will impact uh, how the system is capitalized, but it doesn't really impact food distribution over the short term, over 12 months, if you will. So that's why it takes a while. But that gap is pretty significant right now at 4.5%. Uh, we are expecting that gap to narrow. It has narrowed actually in February. So we are expecting that gap to narrow. And once, once that gap narrows, people will stop being spooked at the grocery store because it's pretty violent at the grocery store right now compared to what we're seeing uh, in the economy. Yeah, I totally agree. And I mean, I'm on record as predicting that the inflation rate overall will be a lot lower at the end of the year than it is now. I guess we'll we'll wait and see whether that comes true or not. I hope you're not. right. I think you're right. Yeah, actually. well, good. And I'm yeah. not, not often right. But now, <laughs> you and I had a quick chat last week and you made me aware of something that I should have been aware of, but I'm kind of oblivious sometimes. I would like you to explain to me, I mean, I think we all know what shrinkflation is. Yes. I go to the store and that bag of whatever used to be this big and, and it's still the same size, but there's less stuff in it, but the price is, is the same. How does shrinkflation get roped into GST and HST legislation? Yeah, so let's start by explaining what is shrinkflation. A lot of you, your, your viewers may not know what shrinkflation is. Uh, it's basically a strategy uh, used by manufacturers when commodity prices go up. When input costs go up, they tend to shrink, reduce quantities to keep the same price, to keep market shares, essentially. And so it's been going on for 40 years, but me, people are way more sensitive about it right now because, because of inflation. And so... That's been going on for, for a very long time, but uh, here's what's new. Uh, now, the CRA, the, Can the, the Canadian Revenue Agency, has had guidelines for several years now, over 15 years, about, uh, about the, the difference between what is grocery and what is not, what is, what is snacks, and what are snacks. And uh, right now, we're seeing more and more products being shrinkflated so much that they're becoming, uh, they're considered now as snacks, not as groceries. For example, ice cream. If you buy a um, container of ice cream below 500 millimeters, uh, milliliters, and there are lots of them, like Hagen Dass, uh, Tim Hortons, uh, Ben and Jerry's, all of them have actually fallen below 500 milliliters. That's a snack now. So if you go to the till, you'll be added, there's, they'll add a tax. And sometimes you don't even notice. It's not really explicitly mentioned uh, on your grocery receipt. Granola bars, uh, six bars in a box, not a snack. Five bars, that's a snack. So it tends to cost way more. So some of the fiscal policies that we have in Canada really add to your food bill without really noticing. And so that's why when people point fingers at Galen Weston and Loblaws and other grocers, they don't necessarily look at the other 
parts. There are lots of moving parts making our food more expensive. And I actually did some research and I went to the Revenue Canada website. And sure enough, what you're saying is actually true. A cereal bar or a muffin bar is zero rated if it's packaged six or more, meaning there is no GST or HST added to it. But if it's in a package of less than six, or if you're buying an individual bar, then there is GST and HST. So here in Ontario, HST is 13%. So I pay 13% more to buy five bars instead of six. I mean, obviously I'm I'm paying more because I'm buying more bars, but there's a a tax on the, the lower number. And so if I'm a parent and I like to put a cereal bar or a muffin bar or uh, in my, in my kid's lunch and I, you know, go to the grocery store every week. Okay. There's five days in the week. I buy a pack of five. I'm paying a lot more than if I was buying a pack of 10 or, or, you know, getting the, the big bulk thing. So that's a, you know, a huge thing. And, and, if I was looking at this a few years ago, everything was packed as a six or a seven or an eight or a nine, but with shrinkflation, I'm now getting tipped over in the five. So that's why this is such a big you're, issue you're, right you're now. You're forced, you're forced to pay it to, to pay a tax basically. Yeah. And it's, and, a, and none of that money goes to Loblaw or uh, the retailer. Yeah. It's, it's going straight to the government, which I guess is good because we all own the government, but this seems to me like something that disproportionately affects people who don't have a lot of money. I can't afford to be investing in the 50 pack of, of cereal bars because I've only got limited cash each month. So I have to buy the smaller ones. So I end up, end up paying more. Now you wrote an article in the Toronto sun that was published on March 29th and you were critical of the federal budget that came out in March. There is a grocery rebate that is coming out, which um, you quote, you are quoted as saying it is a handout is a mirage for the needy. And now I think you agree that Canadians are suffering. I don't think there's any, you know, doubt about that. And I think you and I both agree that the people who are suffering the most are the people at the lower end of the economic scale for the reasons we just talked about. So the government has said, here you go, we'll give you some money. You don't think that's a good idea. One of the reasons you don't think it's a good idea is because throwing out more money just creates more inflation. So prices are going to go up even more. If you were the the guy with the magic wand, instead of the grocery rebate, what would you have done instead? Well, I, I would look. I would have looked at uh, food banks for one. I mean, the food rescuing network is very very efficient. Uh, in fact, our lab uh, worked with the uh, Auditor General of Canada a few uh, a few months ago to review programs that came out uh, as a result of COVID. And the program that was the most effective related to food was the program that actually allowed uh, food banks to get more money to help people right away. The difference between food banks and the government is that food banks can turn on a dime and, and service a population in need. So that's one thing I would have done. And it would have cost probably much less than $2.5 billion. And you probably know this, a lot of that money won't be spent on food. It will be spent on something else. So it's not a grocery rebate per se. Secondly, with a food inflation rate at 10%, I I think as a country, it's time to start thinking about uh, long-term programs. Uh, For example, in the United States, they have this uh, very effective, incredible SNAP food benefit program, which is actually part of the Farm Bill. It's a multi-billion dollar program. It would cost way more than $2.5 billion, but... <clears throat> those those stamps, it's it's the food sta- it's the old food stamp program, would be given to people. They can only redeem at a grocery store buying certain foods, not junk food, certain foods. And we could go even further and basically get people to buy local foods or foods for, from farms and things like that. So you can basically uh, you can create a program and and target. Uh, or at least frame the exchange between supply and demand in a much more meaningful way, in my view, uh, by creating a program like this. I don't think it can be created within the next year or two, but you need a stronger Ag Canada department. Right now in Ottawa, there is a pecking order, and Ag Canada is just not in the top 10. It's just not in the top 15. It's You got the PMO, the PACO, Treasury, Finance. You, you know this. I mean, there's Ag Canada is just not influential. Whereas in the US, USDA is influential. And that's why 
that's kind of their ministry of food. Uh, until we actually create a ministry of food in Canada, focusing on food and, and have a budget looking at food. Because if you look at the budget, there's no, there's no section for food. It's, it's all over the place. doesn't seem like a priority. Clean tech is a priority, but food doesn't seem, doesn't appear to be a priority. And I, I, and I think the governance of the government would have to change in order to accommodate a long-term program to help the needy. Well, and you said that the size of the market was something like $240 billion. So yeah. there must be a lot of ministries that are governing a lot of stuff that's less than $240 billion. So that does seem a little out of whack. I mean, I'm always worried about whenever the government gets involved in anything, because I just figure they're <coughs> going to screw it up. But, um, you know, perhaps I'm wrong. What about just <laughs> just changing the taxes then? So, Well, what, uh, obviously, the, 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 the tax regime is... Uh, is a problem for 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 all of us, really. Uh, I think it's immoral to tax food unless it is served to you, and there's processing on site, uh, like the counter ready stuff that you find at the grocery store. I think that should be taxed, and when you go to a restaurant, that too should be taxed as well. But retail, I don't think food should be taxed at all. Uh, I think we, we need to have a conversation about it, but we both know why nobody's talking about it because it's generating a lot mm -hmm. of revenues for both provinces and the federal government. Yeah, and I guess that's really your point, that if we had a ministry of food, um, both at, I guess, the provincial and federal level and could actually think about not just this specific thing, but how does that impact with the tax system? How does that impact with, you know, clean energy, clean tech, uh, the price of diesel, which obviously I can, has an impact you, on food. I can tell you when I came out with the news that some products are now taxed due to shrinkflation, a lot of people that I can weren't even aware Mm -hmm. uh, of of the uh, of our fiscal regime impacting food prices at retail, so you can see that there's a complete disconnect. And Ag Ag Canada is hardwired to think about Farmgate. It's hardwired to think about production and yields on the farm. That's it, and that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, that's important, but you got to look at the the whole. Oh, it's picture. absolutely important, but it's it's not it's incomplete. Yeah, you need a more comprehensive approach to food. Yeah. So, well, that's very interesting. And you're right. This is not something that's going to be solved uh, next week, I don't think. Um, no. And, you know. The, the, the tax issue can. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a quick fix. You just get rid of that memo that was written in 2007, or you actually modify it. You alter it in order to actually exempt all foods retail. That's it. It's pretty simple. Yeah. And, and I'm a chartered accountant, a CPA. I've studied tax. You know, I, I, I'm, you know, I guess as close to a knowledgeable person about that as anybody. And when you and I talked last week, I went and started digging into the legislation. Good Lord. I mean, it took me a <laughs> while to figure out because it's not like there's one place you can look that has everything. There's this memo in 2007. There's the legislation. There's this. The, so I'm thinking, OK, if I have to spend a whole lot of time trying to vaguely figure it out, then obviously it is a bit too complicated and perhaps some simplification would be would be a good idea. OK, I know you're pressed for time. So my final big picture question for you is, OK, the individual is listening to us here and it would be great if the government could get their act together. But it's not going to happen in my lifetime. I'm an old man. It's I'm not I'm not optimistic. What can the individual person do? I want to save a few bucks on my my grocery bill. Give me some practical tips um, as to as to what I can do. And the first one I want you to tell me about is, is there a difference if I shop on different days of the week? Oh, absolutely. Yes. It, it, basically, if you're doing the same thing today that you were last year, you're spending too much money on groceries. So you, you had to change your tactic. So one, um, location. Uh, most people don't have time to go to more than one place to buy food a week. Alternate between three stores. One specialty store, one big box store, and one uh, discount grocer. So I will alternate. It will make you more knowledgeable about prices, and it will it will actually allow you to pace yourself to know exactly what to buy and where. Okay, that's one thing. Secondly, avoid weekends from Friday to Sunday. Grocers uh, are absolutely. Uh, 
well, they're strategic and they know that on the weekend you're pressed for time and you want to do other things that, other than grocery shopping. And, and there's a lot of volume. There's a lot of sales. There's a lot of traffic. There's lots of people. So uh, they know that really demand is pretty high. So the best days to shop is basically on a Monday or Tuesday. Mondays are problematic because you'll probably see a lot of empty shelves, to be honest, depending on the time that you actually show up. Uh, but really, uh, you need to, to look for options. Uh, if you're a senior, by the way, most grocers have senior discounts on Tuesdays. So those are the kinds of things that you can uh, do to save a lot. The other thing that we're seeing right now for consumers, don't uh, design your menu before showing up at the grocery store. Have an idea, but keep your options open. There's lots of unannounced deals out there now, more so than ever because of inflation. You see, in management, when inflation is at 10%, you can't plan. It's hard to plan. It's hard to actually prepare promotions. So there's lots of unannounced deals beyond the flyers and coupons. If you show up and you see that, you know, enjoy tonight deal at 50%, I'd go for it. That's that's basically, we do it ourselves as a family. All of a sudden, a product, if it's on sale, that becomes the product we're buying. Yeah, I totally agree. And and my wife has explained this to me numerous times. You go to the store wanting to pick up, you know, that particular vegetable. Oh, well, it's not there. It's It's been sitting on the shelves for two weeks. You got to you got to pivot to something else. Now, your your point about weekends, is it because it, like it's it's not like they're raising prices on weekends and lowering them during the week, is it? Or is it just that there are no sales on the weekend? Like why? I, I don't, in a typical grocery store, what are there, 30,000 SKUs or something? Like it's a, it's a About big 20,000 yeah. 20, 20, yeah. individual items. They can't raise the prices on 20,000 items on a Thursday night, can they? What, what is the pricing mechanism? Or they can, because uh, they, if you notice, actually most grocers now have digital pricing. Uh, hmm. So this is what we call dynamic pricing. So they can actually change prices by the hour now. Uh, without you noticing, really. Wow. Wow. And uh, we're seeing, we've been seeing this a lot in Europe, uh, in the US, but it's coming to Canada. More and more grocers are using dynamic pricing. If they have too much of one thing, they'll reduce prices. If they have, if they're running out of something, they'll raise prices. They, they'll influence behavior by, by and, and the best way to do it is to change the price. Wow. Okay. See, I did not know that. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 <laughs> well, if you, if you want, just look at prices nowadays, it's actually pretty, you're never going to see a, 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 a clerk slapping prices on cans anymore or changing. You may actually see some labels, like some printed labels here and there for prices, like specials to attract your attention. Uh, but, uh, and, and be careful. Sometimes actually they're not promotions. They're just, uh, make believe. So that's the other trick that you, you need to be careful. You need to know your prices when you walk into a grocery store because there's lots of promotions that aren't necessarily promotions. Wow. So that's that's absolutely amazing to me. Um, hmm. So we've, we've really got to be on, on our game. You, you said shop at three different stores, specialty, big box, and discount uh, grocery. So you're not saying... And, and I, I want to emphasize on the specialty store because a lot of people, and I know that in, in the GTA, in many, many cities, you do have specialty stores that actually offer you some really good deals. A lot of people think if it's small, it doesn't necessarily mean cheap. Actually, it does. Some independent grocers have some good connections with specific suppliers. And so they'll... Of course, not everything is a deal in those stores, but sometimes to get you there, to get you to work, because they don't offer necessarily everything like a Loblaw or a big box store, but uh, it will it, they will give you some really good deals for specific products. So I, I take the time to actually look around. And I guess particularly if you're looking for something special, you know, a, yep. a particular type of food or whatever, then that would be obviously what a specialty store is. So you wouldn't necessarily be going to, um, I don't know, let's use Costco as the example. You wouldn't necessarily yep. be going there every week or would you? 
I would go every three weeks. Every yeah, three weeks. Absolutely. Okay. So you'd be, yeah. you'd be cycling them around. I go to this particular store, uh, like the, the small specialty store. I'm not going to go buy paper towel and toilet paper because that's not what they, what they do. I go to the, the regular retailer for that or, or Costco's the, they, model is, is the simplest in the world. Costco is a bank. Uh, they don't really finance their stock, their stuff. What, what's on the, on shelves uh, suppliers finance, they have 4,000 SKUs and they make 15, 15%. So when you buy a bar of jar of peanut butter at nine bucks, they make 15% off that. It's pretty simple, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they actually will have what you're looking for. That's the thing. Every week they'll change because it's 4,000 SKUs, 15%. That's what drives their business. And of course, you need to pay uh, the right to get in into that box store, sixty dollars. They make over three hundred million dollars without selling one darn product. It's it's an amazing. It's all about cash flow for Costco, but that's really what they do. They they don't really care if they have a huge portfolio of jam or coffee. All they care about is fifteen percent. Yep, and I did a detailed podcast on that a while ago. I'll put a link in the show notes to it. When you look at Costco's profit, and this is going back a couple of years when I last looked at it, their profit is about the same as what they charge in membership fees. So it is yeah. the it is the membership fees. They can essentially sell all the groceries at cost so long as they're they're getting the membership fees, which is, I guess, a reason to pay the 60 bucks if it makes sense to you. A lot of people will partner up with their friends or whatever. And and, and, and they have two loss leaders, massive loss leaders. So over the years, they've actually maintained that strategy since 1984. Hot dogs at a dollar fifty in the front, and chicken at eight bucks in the back. And you're talking about the rotisserie chicken that's already cooked. That one, yep. Yeah, it's seven ninety nine or something, which is a ridiculous price. You know they're losing money. Yep, but you have to walk yeah. all the way back to the back of the store to get it. So in the front, dollar fifty for a hot dog, and in the back. Eight bucks for a chicken. That's fantastic. So, well, there you go. So that's some some fantastic practical advice. I really appreciate that. Again, I know you've you've got to run. Are there any final uh, comments you would like to make? Either advice, um, you know, anything that that we haven't covered. I know a lot of people uh, out there are are are, are suffering financially. I, I get that, uh, but uh, don't feel that you're uh, you're vulnerable. Uh, consumers have a say. If you eat, if you walk into a grocery store and there is a product that's too expensive, just walk away. There is a substitute for that product somewhere in that store that is much cheaper for you. So, and frankly, if you remember in January, there was this uproar of chicken breasts in Toronto, uh, $36 for five chicken breasts. Well, guess what happened to that those chicken breasts? They were actually offered on sale. They went down 25% the next week. Why? Because nobody bought them. So consumers have a lot of power and, and you need to remember that. Yep. You don't have to buy it, but you've got to have a strategy where, okay, if they don't have it, I'm going to go to the next store. So I got to maybe allocate a little bit more time than just rushing in and, and grabbing something. But if I have a strategy, know my prices, then I'm in, in better shape. Excellent. Well, that is fantastic advice. I really appreciate it. Once again, Sylvain Charlebois, the food professor. I will put links in the show notes to your podcast, to your a bunch of the articles you've written, um, and to your Twitter profile. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you very much for being here. Take care. Great. Thank you. That was Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, the food professor. I will put links to everything he talked about in the show notes, both on YouTube and on um, uh, on the, the uh, audio version, which you can get every Saturday morning on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, whatever it is you listen to. Um, food is obviously a huge issue. It's something that everybody is constantly worried about and concerned about. And so I think it was good that he gave a bit of an overview. This is a worldwide phenomenon that we're experiencing. Um, but there are practical things you can do. And he hit on them. You know, number one, location. Don't just always shop at the same store. There are specialty stores, big box stores, grocery uh, discount retailers. S -s go around, look at the different stores, know what you're looking for, and, uh, you know, go to the store that has the best deal for you. Avoid weekends. I did not realize that dynamic pricing was as big a thing as it was. I guess I should have known that, but I obviously am not paying enough attention. 
Prices will be lower on Mondays, Tuesdays. Mondays, maybe not a great day to shop because the shelves are empty, but Tuesdays, hey, if you're a senior, there might be senior discounts, but by then the shelves are a little bit more full, but the prices have not yet been jacked up, which they would typically do on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday because that's when they know people have more time. So again, be conscious of that. And if you know your prices, you can see when they're, they're doing it. And then the other tip he gave was don't design your whole meal plan before uh, going to the store. Now, this was something that everyone always said, make a list. You have to have a list. I know my mother, you know, 50 years ago when I was growing up, she had a list. She knew exactly what she was going to go to the store to buy. And part of that is important because, well, if I ran out of that thing, I, I, you know, need to buy it again. So I need to have it on my list. But if you've planned out your meals before you go to the store and you go and you find out in his example that chicken breasts are 36 bucks, hey, you know what? I'm not doing chicken breasts this week. I'll do them next week when the prices come down. Let's see what's on sale. Let's let's adjust. So there's a bit more work and thinking involved. But he did say that consumers do have the power. You can buy that thing or not buy that thing. So that's why it's so important to understand what's going on and make an active decision as to, as to what you're going to do. I'll also put a link in the show notes to the episode I did on Costco, which was kind of interesting. And also to the ballad of the $20 bill, the fable of the $20 bill I I did, where I made the point that sometimes you got to save up money so that you can then go to the big box store and buy that 50 pack of cereal bars, muffin bars, granola bars, whatever it is, so that you are avoiding the GST, which is what you end up paying when you're buying in smaller quantities. Not not possible for everyone to do, but again, if you understand how the tax system works, a lot easier to mitigate against it. So, so there you go, food inflation and what you can do about it. I hope that was helpful. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the like button, link, subscribe. We'd be happy to uh, um, get as many, get this word out to as many people as possible. Let's get the YouTube algorithm working in our favor. Um, and if you are listening to the audio version, again, please subscribe so you are notified every week when a new show comes out. That is our show for today. Thank you for listening. I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. <laughs>